please join me in welcoming to the stage Leslie Manville. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Well, thank you for coming out. Yeah. I wanted to start by kind of like looking back at your early career because you actually started out initially training as a soprano singer. I'm yep. Out a bit, but you can see me a bit more. I mean, not that I won't perfect. Be you, but yeah, there you go. But yeah, I'd love to talk about your initial training as a soprano singer and kind of what you learned about craft through that that has kind of fed itself into acting and the way that you approach that over the years. I don't know that it fed into it. I mean, it was something I could do yeah. as a as a as a kid. I did have a really, a really very good soprano, classical soprano singing voice. So um, that was pursued, and I had lessons. And um, I think everyone thought I would go into opera. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed the inevitable thing that I should do. Um, but I, really, based on no real understanding of opera, decided that it was poor. Boring. I'm ashamed. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say that. I can barely admit it. But you know, I was 14, and nobody had ever taken me to the opera. So I thought, oh no, I don't want to do opera, but I'll do musicals. So um, I took myself out of uh, regular school at um, 15, 16, and I went to London, and I went to what was called a stage school, which is different to a drama school. The drama schools were where you went really to learn to act, like Rada and Central and Lambda and all of those slightly highbrow places. I was going to a place where you could go when you were four and you basically did lessons in the morning and tap danced and sang your way and acted throughout the afternoons and left, unless you were successful <laughs> as a performer, you left with very little chance of doing anything else. Anyway, long story short, um, <laughs> I, I went there when I was 15 for about five months to learn to sing and I did some singing and I really learned to dance, which was a great thing. And I started to get interested in acting because there was a very good acting teacher there. Um, oddly enough, who did some improvising, which came to feature in my career later through my work with Mike Lee quite a lot. So I sort of just, I, I started working. My first job was a musical in the West End called Iron Albert, and it was about Queen Victoria, and it was directed amazingly by John Schlesinger. And he had never done a play, and he'd never, certainly never done a musical, um, but he gave me my first job at 16. And, uh, and then I did all sorts of stuff, really. I kind of um, didn't really know I had no sense of direction, uh, and I certainly, w I kept working, but I, I, I really only ever played myself. I did all sorts of things. I did a, I presented a kids' program. I did something called pantomime, which you probably, you might know what that is, but you don't have it here. Count your blessings. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then at age 22, having already been working for six years, I met Mike Lee and um, that was just wonderful because I, it just all clicked with him really and I got it and I got the way he worked and I was completely liberated by this person uh, getting me to play characters that were really not like me at all and I loved it and the rest in a way is history. And one of the early jobs that you had that I think is quite interesting is you were on a soap opera called Emma Dale, which is a really big show over in the UK. And they're so interesting because there's such a quick turnaround between the time that you get your scripts, you have to master the performance and come in and do it. So what were some of the learning curves and, and benefits of doing that early on? Well, actually, when I did Emma Dale, we are talking the mid 70s. It was a twice weekly lunchtime soap that really two people watched in the whole of England. Um, <laughs> And we had loads of time to do it. I mean, it, we did two episodes a week. Yeah. We did lots of it on film. I really learned a lot doing that because we did it on proper film, not digital, not two camera, single camera film. We did all the exteriors. Mm -hmm. And then we came in, we, then we'd have rehearsals mm -hmm. and we'd come into the studio and do two days a week in the studio. So I learned an enormous amount. I did it for about just under a year fantastic learning curve and also I will always be grateful to it not just for that but 
I earned, age 19, some money. And I was able to um, buy myself a flat, which nobody of 19 now can do, yeah. however much they're working in television. They just, you can never save enough money. So I'm very grateful. So it wasn't like a soap now. Yeah. The soap, I mean, Emmerdale is still going. It's now on in the evenings, five times a week, and it's a different thing altogether, and they really don't have any rehearsal. You have to learn it, turn up and do it, but that wasn't the case then. So I actually got a lot out of it. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And then one of your very early theatre productions out of many um, that I thought was quite interesting was Serious Money with Carol Churchill, because mm. I read that that was the first time that you felt really comfortable giving a director specific notes about thoughts that you had for your character, and kind of what led up to, to pushing for certain things for your character, and how has that fed into other roles and other relationships with directors and the conversations that you have now? Well, I, after it was after I made a film with Mike Lee, the first film with him, which was a BBC film called Grown Ups. And although I'd been working for about six or seven years by then, this film went out and it was, you know, it was the kind of Leslie Manville Mark II. Yeah. It wasn't the pantomime Emmerdale girl anymore. It was this... And so it was like I was this new kid on the block, even though I'd been at it for a while. And the Royal Court Theatre in London, which is a very prestigious theatre that's um, primary work is about new writing and nurturing new writers. Um, I, I, I went there and started to do plays with Carol Churchill. Top Girls was the, one of the early plays I did, and another one called Rita Sue and Bob Two, which was later made into a film. Um, and by the time we did serious money. I'd been working there for, for you know, a few years off and on. Um, and serious money came about as a, as, a, as a workshop that all the actors did. We, we were researching this particular area of um, financiers in the city of London. And we'd go out and we'd meet these people and we'd come back to the rehearsal room and we'd do them yeah. for Max, the director, and Carol Churchill. And then, Carol, then we had a big break, a few months. Carol went away and wrote it. And then we came back. And I sort of didn't feel that she'd quite, um, I felt I'd given her more than she'd then written. Yeah. And I remember going to Max and saying, I don't think I'm going to want to do this when it, when, we, when, you know, when it comes to fruition and it actually gets put on, because I don't feel that the part's been realised in the way that I'd hoped. And he said, you must tell her. And I said, well, I, I I did have a chip on my shoulder because I hadn't been to university and I really had truncated my education by going to this stage school. And I was with all these, you know, intellectual people, all these clever people, and I, I felt in some way I wasn't quite worthy of it. So Max said to me, well, you must tell Carol what's, what you feel is missing. I said, I can't tell the goddess Carol Churchill. <laughs> You know, this, I was this girl with not a qualification to my name. And he said something that stayed with me always. He said, look, Carol can write, I can direct, and you can act. And we're all bringing our own things to the table. Um, and I realized then that I, you know, that he was right. I, I could do something that him and Carol couldn't do, and they needed me. So I did go to Carol, and she's such a wonderful woman. And I said, look, I wish you'd got done this or written that and remember when I brought this aspect of her back to and she listened and she went away and wrote it so and then I did it and it was amazing yeah. and and I, I the significance of that is that you know I found my value as uh, even though I was still very young and I found my voice and those two people made me realize that um, you know just because I hadn't been to Oxford it didn't mean that I didn't have something important to say and what I had to say wasn't valid. And you touched a little bit on um, Grown Ups being your first collaborative project with Mike Lee. And since he works in such a different way, I know there's a misconception that it's all improv on film, but you spend the time over several months actually developing the characters in advance. What was it that really intrigued you into working with a new collaborator in that way, since obviously there wasn't a script to look at and jump off of? Well, it was such new territory for me. Um, I, I, I guess I was a very open person, and I, I still think I am. When, when I work with a director, I'm, I'm not, um, I don't expect them to work in a particular way. You know, I'm open to how they want to work and how they want to work with me. Um, but Mike does work in this very specific way, and I just 
took to it really. I, I, it, it made sense to me that if you were going to uh, create a character who would, um, you'd have to really understand their life and get to the point where you could improvise with these in character and it be useful. You know, I mean, when people say to you, oh, come on, let day one, let's start improvising. I think, well, that's nonsense. All you're going to be doing is thinking of what to say, which is useless, pointless. But what, what, what in essence Mike is doing is whereas a writer will spend weeks, months, years maybe writing a script and then you get a script and that's your map of the world and that's what you work with to create the film or the play. He does that process with a whole bunch of actors, but the end result's the same. I mean, we have a script, albeit that a detail I know, but the actors actually never have it written down. But, you know, you do spend these months with him collaborating, creating characters, doing eventually extensive improvisations that then get distilled and honed down and become what is the material that you shoot or put on stage. Um, so it's the same end, but it's just a different route to get to it. And I found it, as a young actress, I, it, it must have just hit a nerve with me. I found it completely liberating. It kind of made, Mike and I are very similar people. We're very thorough, both of us. So I loved this thing of creating a person's life and going back and dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's. I found that thrilling. Yeah. Um, but most significantly with him, he, over the decades that I've worked with him, I, he's always had me playing characters that are a long way from me. And I, I do love that. And that's been the backbone of my career, really. Some characters I play are closer to me, but I love it when they're just really different. Um, uh, and that's really what gets me up in the morning and excites me and still thrills me to act now, you know, even though I've been doing it since I was 16. And when he first cast you, um, he was told that he needed, for economic reasons, to cast from the theatre company at the Royal Shakespeare Company, yes. which you were part of. Yeah. And you've talked about how famously you felt like the audition didn't go very well, but that he was still kind of pushed to hire you. Yes. So how did you centre for yourself going in, knowing that you were a must-hire, that maybe he wouldn't have picked otherwise, and, and to really work to prove yourself to him? Well, it, I, it kind of, it, I only found that out later, because although Grown Ups was the first thing that anyone saw us yeah. do together, we had done, he had been asked to do a play for the Royal Shakespeare Company. Uh, in the end, that play never saw the light of day for various other reasons, which I won't talk about, which are boring, didn't happen. But that is where I met him. Um, but he was, you know, being urged to cast from within the company for economic, I was there already doing another play. But, um, you know, I, I was, I'd come from this stage school and I was a performer, you know, with a capital P. And when he was just saying, come on, let's, we we'll just do this character and think of somebody you know and just quietly potter around as if you're them. And it doesn't have to be, and I, in my head, I thought, well, that's going to be boring. I'm going to entertain you, Mike. So I was <laughs> miming, I was jazz hands, I was, you know, uh, and of course, that's not what he wanted at all. Yeah. But I just didn't know. You know I just, I did just, I didn't really. But once we got over that hurdle, and we, we, he sort of really explained it all, and we started working together properly. I really did take to it like a, a duck to water. And the proof is that I've, I'm his most frequent yeah. collaborator. Yeah. So even though it was a funny, rocky, slightly hilarious beginning. Um, <laughs> Uh, when I was 23, yeah. it's uh, stood the test of time. <laughs> Great. And then one of your early films with him, Secrets and Lies, um, you were playing a social worker and you're up against a woman called Hortense who comes in to see you because she was adopted as a child and is trying to figure out who her mother is. And we actually have a clip of the film that we'd love to show before jumping into talking about this movie. One of the things I find so interesting about the performance that you give there is your character is really there in service of a larger story. She doesn't have a character name. It's delineated as social worker. So I was curious at what point in the development process you know, oh, actually, this is going to be a smaller part. This is how she's going to fit into the bigger scope and how you think about it. Well, this was quite a unique situation, but I'll, I'll just answer that yeah. bit of the question first. When Mike is making a film, um, 
he he doesn't share with the actors what it's about. He doesn't say, right, you're going to be playing this, whatever. But what he he does privately have to work out is the casting, and you know he he might be thinking about making a film about a family, so he's got to cast a mother and a father and children, whatever. So he has to do that. And also, again, you know, for economic reasons, if he's got a cast of maybe 10 people, he probably can't afford to pay for them all for the whole five, six months of the creative process, even before you start filming. So he has to decide some kind of structure who's going to be employed for the longest, and it scales down in that way. Um, and the other thing is that he has a, quite a big repertoire of actors who he works with um, again and again. He always, every job, wants to get in new people as well. Um, and so, therefore, people like me, people like Imelda Staunton, Jim Broadbent, some films we do with him, we have big, nice, juicy leading roles, and other films we do, we have cameos. But the case of Secrets and Lies was quite odd because he'd shot the film completely. I mean, Mike and I are a good friends, but I know when he's making a film, I kind of, I'm not going to hear from him for a while. <laughs> and I knew he'd shot Secrets and Lies, what became Secrets and Lies, and um, he called me up, and as soon as he said, hello, it's Mike, I, I said, what's the matter? Because <laughs> I knew he was in the edit, and, you know, I wasn't expected to hear from him, and he said, um, I've got a problem. He said, we've shot a scene, and it's 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 one scene in the film, but he said it's absolutely pivotal. It's this scene, and he explained to me what the scene was about. And he, he'd shot it with a, a, a male actor. I don't know who, it's irrelevant who. But he said, it's just not right. And so he said, we've got the money, and we're gonna reshoot it, but we've got three weeks to do it, which sounds like a lot for one scene, but. I had to go away and create this character. Now, but of course, unlike normally working with him, uh, he said, look, it's got to fulfill this criteria. She's got to be a social worker who works in adoption. And, you know, that. so I had a week with him uh, talking about uh, people I knew, which is the normal thing you do. You talk about a whole extensive list of people you know who are not connected to the film industry and you, you, you maybe create your character, base your character on, on two or three or four or even five, of five people that you then make a little person X cocktail out of. <laughs> and then he was going away on holiday, so I had a week to go and um, research what it was like to be an adoption person. And then we, um, he came back and we shot it in about three days. So that was quite a unique, I was never meant to be in Secrets and Lies. So, but it, uh, you know, I've never said no to him. Uh, even when it's, um, when he said, you know, you're gonna, I, I, I'm only gonna book you for a month or six weeks, you think, okay, that's gonna be a cameo, which I did in Mr. Turner as well, uh, played Mary Somerville. Quite a lot of research there to play one of the world's great mathematicians and scientists. Um, they bought, actually bought me a book called Physics for Dummies. <laughs> which I took as an insult, but <laughs> I read it nevertheless. Um, but yeah, so sometimes it's big parts, sometimes it's small, but I've, I, I've, I, I can't imagine not ever wanting to work with him because it's always, it's always fascinating. Because you just mentioned Mr. Turner, one of the things I think seems from the outside at least very challenging in terms of the way that you develop the character and you help with coming up with the dialogue is that's a period piece. So how did that differentiate as a result? Well, Topsy Turvey and Mr. Turner, uh, the two um, factual historic pieces that I've worked with him on. And again, it's sort of the same process, but you know what, you know what the end result's got to be. I mean, with Topsy Turvey, which is about Gilbert and Sullivan, I played Mrs. Gilbert. Now, there's not a lot written about her. You know, classic, the woman got ignored. It was all, everything was about Gilbert. I mean, yeah, he wrote a few good tunes, but. <laughs> um, but there was one paragraph that we found about Kitty Gilbert. And it said, um, she was quite petite and he was big, tall guy. She was quite petite, but there was absolutely crystal clear that she wore the trousers. And I thought, oh, I can work with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and then out of that one paragraph, 
um, you know, Kitty grew and um, and they didn't have children. We don't know why they didn't have children, but you know, we we pulled on those strings quite a bit and created created her having wanted children but him not, and therefore that was a, a um, an unspoken tension between them and and, a, and created a an unfulfilled loneliness in her and but yeah it's kind of similar but but different because you know who who they've got to be but of course all those characters are dead now and 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 as with Mr Turner an awful lot written about him and and a lot written about Mary Somerville who I played um her memoirs were really gorgeous to read. I mean, uh, um, yes, she was one of the great pioneering female scientists, um, but there's no way in, you know, six, eight weeks I'm going to get my <laughs> head around being a genius scientist. But her memoir was the most gorgeous thing to read. I mean, she was an exceptional woman. So it, it's love. I felt that I've dipped into so many um, areas of expertise working with him. And he, you, you get to know about all these different walks of life that you might not normally. Yeah. And one of those being in Another Year in which you play Mary, again, with a lot of frequent yeah. Mike Lee collaborators. Um, and Mary's a woman with like extreme fragility and a, a little bit of a broken life. And we see these different snapshots with her coming into the life of her friends, Tom and Jerry, mm. um, and the juxtaposition against then. And we actually have a clip of, of your character, Mary, along with Ruth Sheen's character, Jerry. I had to drink a lot of wine to research playing her. <laughs> And uh, before we chat about it a little bit more, here's a clip from Another Year. One of the things that you do so beautifully with the character of Mary is, like I mentioned, we're seeing these snapshots in her life, so it's not a linear storyline and there's significant amounts of time between each of the scenes in the movie. So how did you think about the different of layers of her and the way that she would have evolved and grown in between when we see her on screen? Well, you know, I don't have to think about those different layers because it's hard to explain, but... When you've spent all this time with Mike, all these months creating this woman, and obviously we've created a woman who's lonely, um, uh, chaotic, um, good-hearted, but uh, you know, uh, um, uh, had terrible, terrible time with men, terrible history with men, and um, drinks too much. Now, when you create that character, I don't have to then think, well, what's she going to be like at the beginning of the film, and how's how she going to be, and what's going to happen when she you know she has this ridiculous flirtation with that other Rusheen's character's mo uh, son, and she's devastated when she sees him with his girlfriend. I mean, there's no way he's going to go out with Mary, but it it be it, it's it's. It, there's a desperation about her, but but I don't. So once I've created her, Mike can put that character in any situation, and I know how she'll behave. You know, you 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 put her in a barbecue, which there is in the in the film. There's a barbecue scene, and she arrives late because she's driven across London, and her driving's appalling, and <laughs> um, and then she's she doesn't she doesn't know when to stop talking you know she just has no ra sensitivity radar she's not tuned in to thinking stop talking <laughs> especially about yourself all the time um so he kind of just sets up the situations that he knew were going to be perhaps excruciating for mary or make mary be flirtatious and you know he's dealing with all of that so it's in in when working with mike it's that none of that's a consideration when i'm working on a scripted piece i have to get the arc of the the story much more in my head and work out how i'm going to pace that dramatically if you like yeah. And given that you're at that point already, once you come into to filming it, how does that shift and change the types of conversations that you and Mike are having on set when you're actually filming it? What, what are the sorts of questions that you have for him in those moments and what are you discussing together? Well, you kind of are very much on the same page because you know what you need to achieve. And in a way, most of the real meat and bones debate when working with Mike happened really early on about deciding what she's like you know, all of those big, big questions. Once you've sorted all of that, it becomes more plain sailing, really. 
Um, but there might be times when, you know, you, you, you do a scene and you have a debrief with him afterwards and you say, well, I don't know, maybe she, maybe she wouldn't have done that. But that doesn't happen that often because you're so, um, you've had so much time. Yeah. This person is very ingrained and, uh, I you know, I in you. Uh, but that's not to say that you take them home with you because you really don't. You know, the discipline with him is that you're very in it when you're in it, but you've also always got to have your own, my own Leslie antennae on the go because always after an improvisation, you'll go and have a one-to-one -one talk with him and debrief it and he'll say, what was she thinking when she said, so, why did she say that? And why did she blow up then and explode? And why was she tearful then? What made those, you know, all of that, you've got to decode it. So Leslie's got to be monitoring it. So yes, you're in character, but it's with, with a healthy monitor going on. So I've, I, I've, I, I think that's been invaluable. One of the questions journalists ask me more than anything is, do I take characters home? You know, is it hard when you do, Mary Tyrone in Long Day's Journey in Tonight, who I'm sure most of you know is a, a morphine addict with a sad life. But no, I don't take it home because it's like it, I'm absolutely in it, but then, whoom, it's gone. And with that particular play as well, there's also a significant amount of time where you're off stage. Are you turning it off in between in those moments and just taking time in your dressing room? Yeah, when I was d did it in the West End and here at BAM, there is a long section in the latter part of the section of the play when she's off for about 40 minutes. Yeah. Oh, I used to have a shower, <laughs> have a cup of tea, read the paper, phone home. <laughs> Got all sorts done. <laughs> Emails. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm fine with that. It's, it's weird, isn't it? I think a lot of people find that strange about me, but I don't because there's a line and there's the line where there's the character and then there's the other, the other side of the line is me, and I don't ever confuse them. Yeah. And then in terms of that whole in-depth process that you're going through with Mike, how has that impacted and influenced the way that you now prepare for roles in other films, given the tools that you've developed through working with him? Yeah, well, I can use it or not use it at my will, really. And um, But more and more, as I've got older, um, I am trusting my instincts a lot more. And... Um, also, you know, the reason for doing that with Mike is because you don't have a script. Mm -hmm. There isn't a person written on the page. And what I'm doing when I've got a script is I'm looking at what, what th that writer has put on the page for me. And there might be some screaming gaps where I think, what's what, why is she saying, what's making her behave like that, you know? And obviously, like with Mary Tyrone, yeah. you, I, I did some practical research about morphine, because, you know, Thank God, I've, I, you know, drugs have not featured in my life at all, ever. So a morphine addict, I needed to understand what that was about. Um, and very interesting that research was, you know, about... Because there are some scenes in that play where she goes upstairs um, and she comes back down very quickly and very different, and very, very, very high. And there are other scenes where she disappears for longer and she comes back and she's not quite there but she's getting there and it's cooking up and this doctor I saw who dealt who worked a lot with people with addiction he said well it depends where she's injected if you go into flesh you know if you inject in the top of your leg just you know, like that or you, it's not going into a vein it's much slower and probably 10-15 minutes to feel feel the hit of it but he said if you actually go into a vein it's almost instant. But, you know, he said somebody like her, who's got a whole set of appearances to maintain, to keep up, you might not go into your vein that much because it would start to, yeah. note, you'd know, you know, it could be noticed. Uh, so really, really fascinating. So that you know, some, sometimes the research is very practical and I like all of that. Um, but. You know, with Liam on Ordinary Love, I, I don't know how many of you have seen it yet, but it's a film, it's it's a really, yes, it is about a woman who gets breast cancer, but I'd hate anyone to think that that's the sum total of it because I think above and beyond that, it is a really gorgeous middle-aged love story, which is quite a rare thing to find these days. You know, 
middle-aged people who still fancy each other, who still have sex, who make each other laugh, who like each other, and have stayed together. Um, now, you could... Two other actors might have sat around for, for weeks analyzing it and talking it. And we instinctively felt that we didn't need that. Because the, the great thing was we didn't know each other at all. And we met actually when I was doing Long Day's Journey here. Because we were about to do Ordinary Love right after that. He lives here and I was here working. So the, the husband and wife director team we had on it came to New York and we spent a few days together. But the first time I met him, he walked into the dressing room after a long day's journey. And I'm, you know, Mary ends the play in her nighty and little flat slippers. Well, me without heels on is still quite small, but me with nothing on my feet up against Liam. You know, I only just reached his belly button, it felt like. <laughs> but we hit it off immediately and we're friends, and we're really good friends now. And um, we just played these two people, and he's so extraordinary to work with. And um, we loved working together. And we would just do the scenes and often shoot rehearsals and get some really good stuff. You know, he's he doesn't do theatre anymore, or hasn't done for a long time. And whether he ever will again, I don't know. But. You know, this is a man who's got proper acting chops. And when you take a, gu a gun out of his hand, it's amazing what he can do. <laughs> I had to take a gun out of his hand most days. He, he would come in and say, I'm going to kill you today, Manville. <laughs> One of the other theatre pieces that I wanted to touch on briefly was Ghosts, also directed by Richard Eyre, mm -hmm. because there's such um, a common thing now of, of filming theatre productions and having them broadcast live into theatres or people can yeah. watch them online. And when that's ha that was one of the plays that this, this happened with, do you allow yourself to think about the cameras that are being there and what that performance would be in terms of accessing a live audience in front of you? I think those... Those things, that the NT Live, which is National Theatre Live, do them. We did, we did Ghosts with a company called Digital Theatre. Yeah. And I'm really torn because so many people who can't always get to London, um, for them it's sanctuary. You know, they, they, they say, so it's, I'm so pleased. I, you know, I, it did, I didn't have to get a four hour train down to London and it costs a lot of money. I can go to the... For those reasons, it's it's only to be saluted. Yeah. But I think for the performers doing it, it's a tricky one yeah. because you do it, the whole point is you do it in front of a live audience who've paid to see you on stage. But then you've got this camera, you know. <laughs> and of course, if you were filming it, just filming it, you, you, you could play some of the scenes quite quietly like that. You know. But you don't, you have to play them like that. And then when you watch it on, you just think, why am I shouting? <laughs> you're not shouting, but you know, yeah. projecting and doing it because you're in a theater. Mm -hmm. So that's the bit of it I think doesn't quite work. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I'm torn because I appreciate that for a lot of people yeah. who don't live near or in London, it's a huge bonus. Yeah. Yeah. So. There you go. Yeah. I can't solve that dilemma, though. <laughs> yeah. I also admire the fact that as recently as 2016, you've continued making short films from Suicide Man to Domestic Policy and The Escort. And I was really intrigued what it is that still really fulfills you creatively and wanting to dive into that, particularly um, because one of them that you did, The Escort, it was actually the director's first narrative short that they'd made. So what was it that was so fascinating and drew you into those specific projects? Well, sometimes short films are being made by first timers. Not always. One of them I did was um, uh, a girlfriend of mine who uh, was just beginning to make films and she'd written it herself and she'd done one before. So that was a different thing. But, well, because um, it's giving back something, yeah. I think, and it doesn't take a lot of time. They're short films, so it's a few days. And um, you think if this, if this, director is going to, wants to learn, th they need to learn about working with actors. And um, I, I'm, I think I'm quite good at 
that. I'm quite good at being helpful and helping them to understand how they need to communicate with actors and what an actor might need. So, um, yeah, I, I haven't done loads of them, but I've done, yeah, as you say, two or three in the last three or four years. And um, I do it for those reasons and those reasons alone. Does that transcend to acting when you're acting with younger cast or people who are newer to the industry that you try to impart that on them as well? Well, I only do what I do and, and they can either they can either observe it. And uh, I mean, I, I, I behave far better than most of the young actors I work with. I'm hastening to add, not on The Visit, which is a play I'm doing at the moment, which is, has a cast of impeccable um, young actors who come prepared, have watched, and really willing to learn and want to learn. But I've done, I've done when I was 30, 32, something like that, I did um, a, a Chekhov play called The Cherry Orchard with Judy Dench. And Judy then must have been 55. And Sam Mendes directed it. He was very young, he was 23. And it was only his second job. And he only got that job because somebody dropped out and the producers said, oh, there's this young boy <laughs> who's just directed a play in Chichester, which is a seaside town, which has a nice theatre company. But that's all he'd done, one play at Chichester. And he came up to London and directed Judy Dench in The Cherry Orchard. <laughs> I know, with a formidable cast. I mean, everyone else in it was really established theatre actors. I mean, even me at 32, I was a very established theatre actress. And he came and um, directed us. And, um, you know, I could not take my eyes off watching Judy. It was fascinating for me because she, she, would, she would do wonderful things. And, I'd, and I'd, I, I was thinking... <gasps> quietly to myself oh god that's so wonderful judy i hope you do that you know that's it now you've you've got it haven't you? you've locked that scene we do it the next time she'd do something completely different and we do it again she'd do something else completely different and i it was fa it fascinating so you know i was a young person watching and learning and i, I yeah i i i think there's i think young people now i don't envy them you know they're 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 th when I was young, c coming to America was never even on the cards. Nobody, nobody came to America and sat around and tried pilot season and <laughs> waited to get a job. You just didn't. You didn't do that. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing because now that you can do it, great. It's a whole another country and a whole area of um, work that can be opened up. But it's the whole, I think it's the whole social media thing that I find so disturbing. And there's very few young actors that I meet that genuinely want to do it, work for the sake of doing the work and want to learn and broaden. Most of them that I meet want to be famous. And they don't quite realize that, you know, that you can't, that's got to have backbone. And they don't want to do theatre a lot of the time. The savvy ones do, you know, the Tom Hiddlestons, the Tom Hardys, who are you know, proving themselves to be great actors. Yes, they they do plays, and they do. I'm not saying plays is the only place to learn stuff, but it's a very it's a very empowering experience to be on stage and be on your own. Nobody's going to marshal you around that stage and tell you what to do and hold your hand. You are on your own and nobody can edit around you and make you look good if you're turning in a bad performance. It's a huge, they don't want to, a lot of them don't want to do theater because they think, well, what, you know, what, so a thousand people are going to see me when I could do Game of Thrones and 800 million people will see me. <laughs> It's different. I'm not being so old-fashioned and not embracing it, but I'm just saying there's, there's caution to be erred. Yeah. <laughs> but one of your castmates who definitely has an incredible work ethic is Daniel Day-Lewis, who starred alongside in Who's that? Phantom Thread. <laughs> Never heard of him. <laughs> Up and comer. He's on social media. Um, <laughs> Can you imagine? I can't imagine anything no. <laughs> more unlikely than finding an Instagram post from Daniel. But he'd do it in character, so it would be great. Well, yes. 
Um, and we actually also have a clip of Phantom Thread before we chat about it a little bit more. Oh. There's so many great things in that scene, but one of the aspects of your performance is there's a great stillness to Cyril, and that's really how she exerts her power, which isn't traditionally how we see that displayed on screen. So how did you go about determining the stillness and, and filling in the gaps between the lines whilst also ensuring that you were matching what Paul Thomas Anderson was thinking? Oh, um, well, first, first and foremost, this, um, just the backstory a bit, was that it came absolutely out of nowhere, this um, film. I was very happy where I was, doing my nice work in the UK. And, and my agent said, um, Paul Thomas Anderson wants to ring you tomorrow at 11 a.m. And I went, pardon? <laughs> she said, he doesn't want a conference call. He just wants to talk to you. I said, OK. Um, and I thought, yeah, well. He won't ring, he'll forget, or he'll ring at three o'clock and I won't be here. And you know, On the dot of 11 o'clock, he called. And um, he said, I've got a script and I'm going to send it to you. Um, I want you to do this film with Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, I, I mean, honestly, I, I c it, was, it was as simple as that. And... Um, but the reason I tell you that is because he sent the script and his scripts are very sparse. He doesn't write a lot of stage directions. So it's quite bald. You know. And he was very unprescriptive about what Cyril should be like. And uh, this was seven months, eight months before we started shooting. So I sat with this script all that time and never... I mean, we met, we then met subsequently a few months later, him and me and Daniel, and had a great night out, and so that was it, and, all, and then all the costume fitting started and all of that whole thing, but he said nothing to me about how I should play her. So I started to think, okay, right, well, what the fuck am I going to do then? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to do something. But... Somehow, having that script with me all that time, and I was obviously reading it and rereading it, and meanwhile researching fashion in the 50s and the great, and all these costume fittings. So this neat woman was in, you know, the costume fittings were hugely helpful. This, and Mark Bridges, who won the Oscar quite rightly for designing the costumes, he, who's brilliant. You know, we did, we, he made me lots of costumes. He, we tried on so much stuff that was just stuff he'd picked up from 50s vintage places, not because that was what I was going to wear, because everything I wore was made bespoke couture. But he wanted to see shapes and things, and it was great, because it started to it emerge that we wanted her to be neat at work, and really not without a kind of sensuality about her. As, you know, so it wasn't to be frumpy. It needed to be, it was just, there was a real neatness and the costumes were all quite fitted and, and that was very much the 50s thing, the nipped in waist. And so that helped it all to sit with me. But again, still, it was all subconscious. But the great thing about Paul Thomas Anderson is You'll get there, and you'll 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 start shooting these scenes. And once you start doing something, he picks up on it, and he'll run with something. And I remember I did a little thing, a little detail in one scene. Um, those glasses that Cyril wears, um, and because her hair's always slicked back in this bun, quite often if I take my glasses off bits of hair come out with the glasses and then it's not neat anymore. And I thought Cyril would be so neat. So I, there was a scene and I took the glasses off and I went like that with both hands and smoothed the hair. And he went, no, I, love, I love that, I love that. I love it when you do that. And, and so we did that a couple of times and we, but he, he runs with something that you do and then he'll add to it. I mean, I'm making him sound like it all came from me and he just said, oh, yes, I like that, do it again. <laughs> and it wasn't like that. He would, he would see a small thing and he would 
allow that small thing, if he thought it was in the right territory, to grow and expand. So I think her stillness came out of a, a for me, in originally, the, the costume fittings, that it was this neat and and I thought, yeah, she's neat, she's precise. She's spent her life, not married, looking after this child who's her brother and running the business. And uh, I thought, the more I thought about her, the thought, no, less fuss, less fuss, less fuss, less fuss. You know, and she speaks her mind. Yeah. But hugely aided by Paul and, um, you know, great to see that and then what Daniel was doing and how we could um you know we had to we had to create this brother and sister who were so comfortable together that they could just sit and have a whole entire dinner and not say a word and were absolutely comfortable with that and I suppose in the way with Liam and I you know how do you represent a 30-year marriage and I'm I mean two pretty good leading men so it's not it's not been that difficult really <laughs> <laughs> and in juxtaposition to the way that you talked about working with Mike Lee where you really discover the character in the lead up with Paul Thomas Thomas Anderson on set his style is to do several takes and shoot scenes over several days so how does that give you a different freedom to explore and discover the character once you're already playing it on set and actually filming yeah well the first scene I shot with Paul was um the, the the scene quite early on in the film when they go to the country and he f Reynolds first meets Alma that mm -hmm. Vicky plays yeah. and then Cyril arrives a bit later and that was the first scene we shot now on the page it's it's a page and a half that's all it is and there's not much dialogue he's measuring her Cyril's writing it down and looking at this girl and thinking what's going on here we shot it for three days and then about two days after that, I said to Paul, oh, I said, you know what it's like, you know, you always want to reshoot your first day because you, your first scene, because you, you then start to feel a bit more comfortable and you think, oh, maybe I just do that again and it will be better. And he said, oh yeah, no, that's fine. We're going to reshoot that anyway. I thought, oh, <laughs> three days. He said, I didn't like, I didn't think the lighting was right. Uh, I didn't think the dress that was being fitted on Alma was right. And he said, I don't think your costume was right. And it was the only time that we really saw her out of London yeah. in her country gear. And we'd actually gone a bit frumpy. It was a bit tweedy and thick and it made me look kind of, you know, a bit, yeah. it wasn't right. So we, we changed it and just made it, it was the first, the only time you see her with her hair down. And we just made it a bit more, like the stuff she wore at work, but a bit more, bit slightly more flowing and less fitted. Yeah. So we reshot the whole that page and a half again, not quite for three days, but the good the best part of two days. Yeah. And there was lots of stuff that we shot that didn't make it to the film. Um, and 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 he he said it was because the, when he started to edit, because uh, there were other characters in it not main not featured characters it was always mainly about the three of us but there were peripheral characters in it you know wi other women from Reynolds life other models and and he said the more he edited it the more he saw that this was a film about this brother and sister and this woman who then came into that so he got rid of lots of extraneous stuff and at the end the producer said to me of the 14 week shoot, they'd probably discarded three weeks of filming. You could make t eight, 10 short films in that time, <laughs> couldn't you? <laughs> anyway, and that's not to say there was a big budget and people were going, oh, never mind, doesn't matter how much it costs. I mean, it did. Because as soon as you do anything that's period, it costs a load of money. And the costume budget, must that must have eaten up loads of the budget. Imagine. Yeah. One of the other characters that you've played where in a very different way you were filling in a lot of the gaps in the script is your role as Kathy on the TV series Mum. Oh, yeah. Because so much of what's happening is happening around her and very much the perspective that we see that show is all through her eyes. Yes. So how did you work similarly or differently in terms of bridging those gaps and finding her stillness in a completely different way? Um, 
I was helped a lot by uh, Stefan, who writes it, and uh, Richard Laxton, who directed the first series, a great director. Stefan, the writer, ended up directing series two and three. And um, yeah, I mean, I, we, we, we didn't all hit the ground running with that. You know, we, it, it was, it's such a delicate, it's almost wrong to call it a sitcom, really, because it's, it's just this gorgeous drama that observes this, uh, observe, observes a woman who's just been recently um, widowed. And it charts the story of this kind of slightly ridiculous group of people she has around her, including her son, his girlfriend, her brother, and his girlfriend. And then this other wonderful man that Peter Mullen plays, who's a lifelong family friend. And the three series, uh, we always knew it would only be three, charts them very slowly falling in love. And it's so paced, slowly paced and nuanced and delicate. But it took me a while to see that um, the audience need to, the audience are seeing it through Kathy's eyes. So when Kathy's thinking somebody is saying something ridiculous, Kathy doesn't need to, reg doesn't need to show that. She just needs to look and listen. And the audience know are thinking the same as Kathy's thinking. They're thinking, I can't believe that person's just said that. And Kathy's thinking that, but she's such a good woman. She doesn't ever hurt anyone's feelings. Um, and since we've been diving into talking about ordinary love a little bit, uh, we actually also have a clip of, of this film beyond the trailer that we saw earlier. So I'd love to, to play that and then we can chat about it a little more. There are some laughs in it as well. <laughs> There's such a, a double-sided part to that performance because as we saw in that scene in itself, mm. there's the physical side of, of what she's going through. I've got some tissues down here for you. It's upsetting, isn't it? And then there's also the emotional journey that she's going on. So I'm curious how you thought about those different beats and the moments that you felt were really important to draw out and what that, that journey is for people. Well, you, oh, it's... this. The, the, the film is... Um, uh, it's not a secret that Owen McCafferty, who's a very celebrated Irish playwright, it is the story of him and his wife. They they went through this. Peggy is still very much alive and with us and out the other side of it. Um, and he'd never written a film before, and he was encouraged to write it, and obviously with Peggy's permission and everything. Um, and you, you, you don't want to take a subject like that and... Um, you know, sugarcoat it in any way. You've got, you owe it to all those people who've been through it and are going through it to do it honestly and properly. Um, and Tom and Joan are a very, uh, they're a really, they're a really good couple. They're, you know, it's the kind of marriage relationship you envy. You, you it's, it's, a, it's an, un, it's a very simple life but they have such profound love for each other that it's very special. But this, um, that's the only time you see them really at blows. And um, the film needs that. It comes at the right point. Um, it's very challenging for a carer because they, he says to her, I'll be with you every step of the way. And we know what that means, but Nobody can be with you every step of the way. They they can be there to make your tea and and he's doing what he he thinks is the best. Th you know he's trying to he thinks by giving her the notebook and she fills it out which tablet she took and what time she took it. That's his way of controlling it and m making it better for her. But you know she's in another place and. Uh, you know she's right. You, 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 he isn't going through it, and the loneliness of that. But it's a, it's a, the, the right moment for that to happen because it. And it wasn't. You know we didn't discuss it really. You can't. How can you discuss how you play something like that? You, you get in the zone, and uh, the crew were fantastic and very, very loving and supportive because we'd have huge laughs, you know, tea break, great. You know, they're Irish for God's sake. <laughs> we rapped and there'd be Guinness all over the place. <laughs> but when we were in it, they were very, and of course a lot of them had had, we've all had, we've all 
got somebody who we know or nearly know or friends and relatives they they it was very close subject to a lot of their hearts and when you know when we were doing scenes like that you know it was there was a gr an enormous sense of the whole room being in on it you know um but we didn't over discuss those things you know i'd get you know i'd get made up i'd get the bald cap on which would take a long time and um you know and you get sweated up and wrapped up in all those things and then i don't know you i don't know i can't sometimes it's hard to analyze and it doesn't bear analyzing it sometimes it's just it's just acting yeah. but mm. under the right circumstances you know i was acting with the right person and i had all good people in the room helping and um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of acting. Yeah. And given that you started off filming some of the, the very simple scenes with Liam Waite, the two of you are just spending time together as a couple on the sofa and having conversations about very normal mm -hmm. things. How did that lend itself to really just instantly finding that chemistry and what their relationship was going to be like? Yeah, I mean, it is fine. We did laugh. I mean, the first scene we shot is that one quite near the beginning when they're sitting on the sofa, just watching television. They've had one of their power walks and they've got one of those Fitbits on, you know, that tells you how far you've walked and how, and how your heart rate's going and, you know, what you had for breakfast yesterday or whatever, they too. And he's going, how does the Fitbit work then? And uh, what, what if you put it on your arm and or your leg or something? And... and 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 she's saying, well, well, you wouldn't put it on your leg. He said, well, if if you'd had a stroke, you probably couldn't put it because it, yeah, it's a ridiculous conversation that they have. But it's like this two people, thirty years of marriage, you know, action, and you think, oh my god. Um, but I, as I said, I think it was clever casting because I think they knew that we would both be all right together. And I, I, every single, I mean, I've been here for days now doing press and I've done all the, the film open last year in England, so I've done all that. I did Toronto. The thing everyone says was um, ha what good chemistry we have. And I, I, I don't know, because we didn't, we haven't known each other forever, but we know each other now and he will not stop WhatsApping me. <laughs> and because he's in New York and I'm in London, and I hadn't until quite recently learned that you can mute somebody on <laughs> WhatsApp. <laughs> because he's a famous bad sleeper, Liam. He's a, he, he, so he stays up late, he reads a lot, he watches, he likes crime dramas. He like, so he's often still awake at 4 or 5 a.m. And, and then he'll sleep for about 4 or 5 hours. And so sometimes, you know, uh, he'll, be, he'll be sending messages um, uh, and it's, uh, or, or he'll send them, you know, when he's gone to bed and trying to sleep, and I am asleep. <laughs> and it used to go ping, I thought, that's Liam. <laughs> but I've muted him now. Yeah. I didn't have the heart to tell him that the other day, though. <laughs> <laughs> now he knows. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also interested because it was co-directed, how Glenn and Lisa really worked cohesively together to ensure that way, the way that they were communicating to you between scenes about what they wanted, what they needed, wasn't contradictory at any point and that they made that a really cohesive experience. You'd think it could be worrying, couldn't it, two people and you think, oh, are they going to both come at me and what if they don't agree and they're married for Christ's sake. They could be having issues between each other and then they let it all out on me and Liam, but um, <laughs> I know. You've obviously been there. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I hasten to add that never happened. But there were, it was kind of, um, they obviously, Lisa and Glenn were, were um, collaborating and talking all the time. But really Glenn dealt with the camera technical side of things and the design aesthetic of things. And Lisa really was the person who dealt with Liam and I. So it was it was really lovely. They're such lovely, lovely people. Uh, yeah. And they also made a point of having real life nurses and technicians yeah. for all of the medical scenes where she's yep. at the hospital. How did that lend itself and really support you oh, and the performance I, that you were given? That was invaluable because, um, you know, I, I, I didn't know what it was all going to be like because I, 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 I have not been through it. So um, it was... It was great. They explained it to me, and um, 
you know the what the the scene early on where where uh, where she has the biopsy and you know, the thing about that needle is that it makes that horrible clicking noise and um and and that she said that's not a very nice bit you know that can that can hurt a bit and there's this noise so you know so and they they did the knee they didn't do it to me, but obviously, but they had the needle and they made the noise so I could really react off that. And then the chemo nurse was extraordinary, just telling me, you know, I just thought she was one of the world's great women, you know, she, all she wanted to do was make the person she was applying the chemo to yeah. feel good and better about themselves. And, um, I mean, just amazing, amazing women. Yeah. They really were. And that was so invaluable, yeah. having them. And they look, you know, it, there wasn't a moment either when you, I mean, I, they didn't have dialogue and things, but they they were there and doing it. And they, they, they just look absolutely comfortable. They don't look like, you don't think, oh, well, that's obviously not an actor, you know. They were, they were great, really great. I wanted to dive into some of the questions that we got from the audience this evening. Oh. Um, this first one is, there's been a considerable talk of late regarding how difficult it is to pursue an acting career today if you don't come from a privileged background. And what's your advice for those who struggle just a little bit more than the rest of the herd, which kind of touches upon what you were saying earlier, where you really jumped straight into the industry at 16 without mm. those connections already in place. Well, no, because when I was 16, uh, I, I'm, I'm from a working class family. My parents couldn't have afforded and I had to travel from Brighton to London yeah. as well. I got a 100% yeah. uh, grant yeah. and they paid my travel and everything. Um, so that it, that was fine. There was then this horrible, there was this horrible mm -hmm. period of decades when all those grants were cut, you know, everything cutbacks, cutbacks. Yeah. And so it became something that only kids with wealthy parents could do. It's being addressed again now, but, um, I mean, it, and there are places now also in London where, where uh, you know, st uh, specifically for mm -hmm. people that ha haven't got parents who can afford it, but also RADA and that, you know, they are, they have to open their doors to everybody. Great. Um, this next question here is from Susan, who's saying, what was it like to go from your role of Kathy and mom to Lydia in Harlots? It seems like an actor's <laughs> dream to be challenged by such vastly different roles in such a short space of time. Oh, I know. It really was. I mean, the lovely, quiet, peaceful Kathy to the yeah. monstrous Georgian brothel madam Lydia Quigley, uh, who was quite theatrical, yeah. quite a theatrical character, really. So I could go to town with her. Um, and uh, I know it was great, but you know that is that is what I love. I love yeah. that difference and that um, um, uh, change of characters. And yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I could, yeah, it, it, I, I can be. I'm quite good at being nasty. <laughs> 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 I think I exorcise all the demons of my life, but through the characters yeah. that I play when they're horrible. <laughs> Um, this next one here is from Laura. Have you got any desire at any point to direct or have any acting or other projects on your heart that you specifically want to do in the future? Well, I was asked to direct a few years ago and I kind of went up the road with it for a while and then I backed out because I felt I didn't want ultimate responsibility. I, I, I didn't, I di and I didn't feel I was capable enough of having... Uh, I think as a director, you have to have such clarity, mm -hmm. such overall an overall vision. Yeah. And, you know, I don't create my characters in isolation. I do sometimes if I've not got a very good director, yeah. but I don't like to do that. I like to collaborate. Yeah. And I just felt that directing seemed to be something where you have to have all the answers and everyone comes to you and the buck stops with you. Mm -hmm. And I thought I didn't really want that ultimately. Yeah. I think if I ever did direct, I would direct a play. Mm -hmm. I think that would be much more, more up, up my street. Um, and as for parts, no, I don't, I don't, I don't have a list of parts that I, w I want to do because, you know, who knows what new plays can be being, being written, new films. Um, and I've done some of the great classics on stage. Uh, I've done very little Shakespeare, um, but you know I'm not kind of thinking I must do loads of Shakespeare because I, I mean I, I'm so happy to have done Ghosts and Long Day's Journey. They they were m m 
they are, I mean, Long Day's Journey Into Night is the most spectacular piece of writing I think I've ever come across. Um, just truly great writing. Um, so, you know, I'm happy really. And, and, and whatever comes along, comes along and I'll, I'll, I'll either like it enough to do it or if I'm, if I can, I, I will say I will pass on things for as long as I can cope with doing that, you know, financially and, you know, as long as that's viable. Uh, the next question we have is from Ileana about whether there's been a point in your career where there's been a major challenge for your career um, and what you did to overcome it, if so. There was a time after I did this first film with Mike Lee Grown Ups, which was when I was about 23 or 24, when I knew that the six or seven years previous to discovering Mike, um, I'd done lots of lovely work, but I'd really just played, you know, nice young girls and, and they were always like me because I didn't know how to not be yeah. me. Fine, but I knew I didn't want to do that anymore and I knew that I kind of wanted to get into a more interesting vein of work. So um, the gap between finishing Grown Ups and it coming out was probably almost a year, maybe 10 months or a year. And I got offered things in that time, but I thought, no, I'm going to wait for this film to come out because I'm really different in it and it's a different Leslie and I really want people to see this because I had a feeling that it would it would just kickstart something else that was different from the kind of work I'd been doing. And so I held out and I really had no money then. I mean, really had no money. Um, but I stuck to my guns and it paid off and that's probably the longest I've ever been out of work. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge, but I was young. You can cope with anything when you're young, can't you? Yeah. Um, and in a slightly similar vein, this question from Porter, looking back at your career choices, is there anything that felt like it was a misstep at the time that you later realized was a great move, i.e. accepting one role over another, taking time off, taking on a risky role? No, I've, I've, I, I kind of stand by the decisions I've made and not because I look back and think, oh, that was a bad decision, but I'm going to stand by it. Um, I've always considered things quite carefully. There, there was one job I did, which was a telly, um, and it was fine, absolutely nothing to be ashamed of at all, and I did turn in a good job, and I worked with some good people on it. But it was just, a, I was just about to go on the road with another year with Mike, which, you know, we did Cannes Film Festival, and then we did Toronto, and then we did lots of press here, and in LA, and in England, and it's some months out of your life, and, you know, you, meanwhile, you've still got bills to pay. Um, and I wasn't in the position then that I'm in now. So I, I, did a, I did a telly that paid me and I knew it would make, make the, the next th three or four months when I wouldn't be earning anything, um, I could get through them. So you know, I, I, I didn't really want to do that telly, but I did it and I had a good, very good reason to do it. But that's really all I can think of. Um, uh, you know, I try to do jobs that I, I I I think will give will interest me and keep me keep me um, being vital about my work and on the ball and yeah. yeah. And I wanted to touch a little bit on the play that you're in right now at the National Theatre, taking a couple of days off to come here and do all of this. Uh, the visit. Well, I d I, d I don't think I've got an understudy going on or anything. It's at the <laughs> National Theatre, yeah. so plays are in repertoire. Yeah. So I actually have a nine day break. Yeah. So, yeah, I haven't just thought I'm just going to go for a few days. <laughs> like Somebody nice else holiday can do in New York. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to clear that up. But one of the challenges of a, of a play like that is the, the run time's around three and a half to four hours, I think. It was four point. hours on our yeah. first preview. It's Tony Kushner, what can yeah. I say? He doesn't write short. Yeah. Um, but it's now down to three and a half. Yeah. But it's still a meaty evening. Yeah. Um, so how do you go about setting yourself up in terms of making sure that you're emotionally prepared and physically prepared to do that performance several times in a, a week? Well, we only, we've only done it for about a week and a half so far. And the day I flew here on Sunday morning and on the Saturday we'd done it twice for the first time. Um, that was quite a challenge. But it's, mo I mean, the, the play is, is yeah. hard work, no doubt about it. And the language is so, I mean, he's a brilliant writer, isn't he, Tony Kushner? It's very, he writes sentences that you just think, oh, 
say that to me again. That's such a wonderful sentence. And it, it's beautiful, his yeah. writing. Um, uh, but the, uh, the, almost the biggest challenge of the play, the, character, <laughs> the character's got one completely false leg mm -hmm. that's made of um, porcelain. Mm -hmm. And the other leg is false from the knee down and is made of silver. So I've had these extraordinary contraptions made that are actually quite comfortable. But it does mean I can't bend my right leg very much. And that's fine when I'm on stage because I'm not meant to bend it at all. So that it looks like it's a completely solid fake leg and I have a walking stick and all that. It gives my shoulders a bit of jip, but that's fine. But the problem is that it's on the big stage at the National, the Olivier, which is a vast stage and it has this revolve in it but also underneath the revolve is what they call a drum and the, the the stage can revolve and it can section in half and a whole nother other set can come up from the drum and there's a couple of scenes that are played in a, a forest and I come up on the drum from in the forest well getting down to the forest is a lot of stairs <laughs> and then and you're not allowed to use the lifts during the show in Kate case they break down and then there's a that they've built a bit of the set right up in the flies this great big metal gantry it's very um it's very um what's the word it, um it, it it's very um oh what is that word <laughs> it's very there you know it's very oh look at that there's like this imposing Im that's the word thank you imposing <laughs> it's very imposing but to get to it is five flights of stairs. Oh my God. And so I, I, and I'm walking with this leg that I can't really bend. And then I have to get up there, do that. And then I have to finish that. And then it's the interval. But then I've got to walk all the way down and go and do a costume change. And so there's no time for a cup of tea. And then I've got to go down <laughs> into the forest and then come up from that and then go back down in the forest and walk up and then back up to... So it's hard enough on stage, but boy, oh boy, the challenge is mostly navigating the stairs uh, um, <laughs> backstage. So I've only done it, um, we've done about 12, 13 performances so far, but only one day was, has been a matinee. But yeah, when I go back, we'll have two matinee days a week. And at this point in your career, having such an amazing scope of screen and theatre work, what part of the craft do you still feel the most excited by and what do you feel that you're still learning each time you take on a new project? Um, oh, I do love doing a play. I, 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 don't get me wrong, filming is... I, 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 I love it. And because I, I thankfully get to work with such good directors. So I'm, I'm, I'm really very lucky. But I do love a play and when it starts to come together and and you're just ripping around the rehearsal rooms and everybody's coming up with something exciting and interesting and you you watch it cook slowly it's a it's a slow casserole that's been in the oven for eight weeks and then it comes out and it's gorgeous whereas a film is you know it's it's a it's a souffle you've got to cook it really quickly and that was clever wasn't it you see what i did <laughs> Um, so I, the thrill of doing a play, it, I, I, that's never left me. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I, I couldn't go, I can't really go a year or two without doing one. Well, thank you so much for coming out this evening. Thank and you. Ordinary Love is out in theatres now via Bleecker Street. So please tell all your friends to go see it. And if you haven't already, check it out this week. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.